Director of the UMS Technology License, Licensing and BioVentures Life Science Incubator Program. He's Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and he's a member of the Technology Corps of the Board. Thank you, Dr. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, Mike, most of you can probably stand up and give this talk that I'm giving to you today, but I thought what I'd try to do, unfortunately, for whatever reason, the presentation didn't transfer, and I've got them making up some, a slide set for me now so that we'll hand out. Not everyone will actually have hard, hard copies that we can look at and work through. But uh, basically what I wanted to do today uh, was just sort of look at this from the internal perspective, from the UAMS perspective, and just try and bring everyone up to date on where we are now and what we think we're going to do as we move forward here. I am, I am a member of the Research Technology Park Board. I'm one of two UAMS uh, representatives on the board. The board consists of seven people, two from the city, two from UALR, and uh, one from the, um, the regional chamber. Uh, just a little bit of an advertisement for BioVentures, the program that I direct. And it will be on one of those first two slides that you get a chance to look at as soon as uh, they show up here. Um, basically, we're a federally funded research uh, facility here. We, we derive a lot of our research income uh, from federal grants. And we have a, your tax dollars. And we have an obligation to make sure that if smart guys like you invent things, here in the university using those federal dollars, that we do two things with it. One, we report back to the government that these smart guys have generated uh, some intellectual property and we capture that in a patent. And the second thing we do, we report that to the government. The second thing that we do uh, with that technology is we try to find a buyer for that technology. So if someone is come up with a new cure for cancer or a new device that's important in surgery, whatever it is, uh, we try and make sure that we've got a proprietary position on that, and then we take that to the world. And that is the way that the private equity, uh, our private capital, comes into this intellectual asset so that it grows, goes through the FDA, becomes a new therapeutic, a new surgical device. And that is what we call commercialization. So that is what we do. Here comes some, we may have to end up sharing. I don't know how many people we're going to end up with. But if you guys could look on with your, with your buddies, I can promise you everyone can have a copy when we leave. Um, so so that's, what, that's what we do as what, what is termed a technology transfer office. Uh, every federally funded research facility in the United States uh, that, that receives those federal monies, they are actually uh, required to have all those federal dollars. It's the way we maintain our accreditation. So, there we, if I could just use one of the okay. uh, Again, those of you who have been given, uh, look on and I'll make sure you get a copy. So on that first, so I've sort of jumped over that first slide that you see on the bottom of that first page, and I'll look on. But sort of our life here uh, as a university that's generating these intellectual assets and trying to drive these through to better health care, ultimately. That's what we're delivering. It is really a most noble venture that we're all involved with here. Uh, we sort of work on this uh, innovation life cycle uh, creating churn from about um, from about nine o'clock to uh, three o'clock for the most part. Okay, so we're we're up in that knowledge creation quartile and technology transfer quartile. We're generating those intellectual assets and we're developing those into better therapeutics, better delivery of healthcare. You name it, that's what we do. So. That's the job that I have as, um, as in, the, in the Office of Technology Management. What we have that's sort of unique, in fact, quite unique, is 
We have also a university-run life science incubator that sits at the corner of Cedar and Fifth, Fourth Street, just across from the parking lot, Biomed One. And as we start looking for people to license those technologies, what we end up doing actually is forming young companies around some of those some of those technologies. So we can license that to a Novartis, to a Merck, and we've licensed a lot of our technologies to Merck for their use. Uh, if the investigators, the inventors of that technology want to take those inventions and develop their own company around them, we help them do that. Again, I apologize that the, the slide set didn't make it over here, but but you've got hard copies here. So if we go to that second page, what I've been sort of babbling about here for the first four or five months is that um, there are really two functions that our two functions that our uh, our facility here has. Us as UAMS, me as head of UAMS BioVentures has. We have two functions. One is to license the technologies uh, to the world. And the legislation that directs us to do that is by goal legislation. It's passed in 1981, and it basically says that we have to, as a federally funded facility, ensure that you, the citizens, you, the people that are paying for that with your tax dollars, are getting the best return possible on those tax dollars. Because ultimately, if we want to see more money flow into research, we have to be able to justify that, and we have to give our legislators in Washington opportunities to do that. The second bullet point on that top there is basically um, the reason that I'm standing here in front of you today for the most part. Again, we're relatively unique. We have our own uh, incubator that houses up to 14 companies in it that we help get started with these young technologies. So if I'm Dr. X here at UAMS and I've decided that I want to take my invention and I want to put to a, an entrepreneurial group around it and I want to help bring uh, uh, private dollars to that, investment dollars to that project and grow that little technology in that business, we help them do that. That's what we do every day. That's actually a very fun job for us. But it creates, it actually creates wealth. Uh, around that technology. And creating wealth is a very important sort of point to make here. I've gotten in trouble for saying that, but ultimately we have young companies that are every day growing uh, in value because we are taking those technologies through various steps of the FDA. We're taking them through different steps that, that uh, really take the risk out of that to deliver better technologies. Um, so it's connecting intellectual property, you guys. It's connecting people. In this case, it would be entrepreneurs. And it's capital. So we have, I have a network of venture capitalists that come to Little Rock and listen to our stories of our young companies. And we help sort of bring new dollars to those, to those technologies. Um, as part of what I do in the community, and I talk a lot to the community about what we're doing here at UAMS, we are probably, BioVentures is probably one of the more visible interfaces to the, um, to the community here. So uh, one of the things that occurred in 2005, uh, it was started by my predecessor, Tim O'Brien, who was the previous director of BioVentures, but I've taken it over six months after it got started. We formed a technology task force uh, through the regional chamber that basically had a number of different subcommittees on it. One of those subcommittees sort of dealt with a, with a tech park, the concept of a tech park. Uh, were we ready for that tech park here in Little Rock, and was the time right for it? And what I'm showing you on the bottom part of page two is really a timeline that I've just pulled off of the website. Uh, there's a Little Rock Tech Park website that has some information on it. Some of that information is a little dated. It needs some more files and stuff put on it that uh, haven't made it yet, but they will. So basically, this biotechnology task force was the beginning of the tech park. And sort of in that, uh, and that was 2005 when that was started, and in the, in the uh, summer of 2006, 
I took over and we really went to look at what that best practices were for tech parks around the country. And there should be some PDFs that are on the website that have uh, some discussion of that. We'll get into a little bit of that today. But basically, it was just to look and see what was going on in the way of tech parks. Um, what were working, what weren't working, how, how much success they had. In April 2007, uh, Part of that task force working with the state legislators uh, uh, put into pl place uh, a, uh, a research park uh, authorities bill, which was uh, signed into law in 2007. And that was a bill that basically established research park authorities. I think there were three to five of them across the state. One in Northwest, one here in Central, and I think one maybe associated with Monticello and, and maybe Pine Club. I don't know how many, but this one can look at that. Sort of consistent with that, basically establishing those research park authorities was basically a mandate uh, if you know all of the stars align and, and these communities could pull their resources together, a research park authority could be initiated. Uh, and that's all described in, the, in that act, uh, Tim. 45. I'm not going to drill into that. Uh, we sort of went through a lot of briefings. We worked very closely with um, with Accelerate Arkansas, who helped us, and a new um, a new organization, uh, the Arkansas Research Alliance, which was getting started about that time, and utilized uh, a Battelle study. Battelle is a sort of contract research organization that really looks at communities and can sort of sift from those communities a large, uh, large from a large amount of data, sort of what, uh, what sort of requirements your region has, what sort of, um, what, what is the, what is the sort of scientific capital that we have in central Arkansas that would demand a research part, and how much is here, and what would that what would that actually uh, look like? And so we did essentially an inventory uh, of Arkansas. Uh, Battelle helped us do that. We did that in conjunction with a study that Jerry Adams and the research, uh, the Arkansas Research Alliance were doing. And that sort of gave us essentially some sort of inventory that said what we needed here in central Arkansas. We had um, the sort of the research firepower and the research uh, draw to this region that we would support about a 30 acre uh, research park. Similar to the um, parks that were found in other sort of um, urban settings. Um, and so that was uh, basically the issue uh, that we had a need for a park of a certain size and that we could support that. Uh, with the technologies that we have here and that we're growing here. Uh, September of 2008, we initiated uh, a, a study. Bids went out for uh, studies to basically provide to us from this input of the research inventory that we had in the region, what that part should be, where, it, where recommendations would be for its location. And the angle report, again, it's available on the site, sort of came back, and that was in 2009. Uh, sort of after sort of everything had been collected, the angle report delivered a study that said your site should be about 30 acres. Uh, it should sort of, in the end, sort of reflect what's seen in uh, research parks that are in other areas with a similar uh, sort of research footprint, if you will. And that was about 30 acres and about a million square feet. Built out. So that was that was sort of what the annual report told us, um, and then from there we sort of started into the process of under the uh, under the uh, direction, I guess, if you will, of the of the research park authorities bill to create the research park authority here. The universities were the sponsors in this. Um, UAMS was in uh, was a sponsor. UALR was a sponsor, and Children's Hospital was a sponsor. What a sponsor meant: the sponsors 
were asked to put up I think, $125,000 to sort of put together at least some of the initial uh, uh, financing that would be used to sort of support the early start of the, of the um, park authority. So that sort of brings us to about 2011. Um, uh, with all of the memoranda that were in place and, and uh, the, the financing was in place, I will say that uh, Children's Hospital, because of their charter, is a sponsor in this financially, but their charter prevents them from being uh, sort of a full sort of player in this somehow. I don't know what all the rules are, but basically Children's is with us in, in spirit and, um, and as a sort of anchor player in this with us, but, um, and has supported, uh, supported this. As you know, there was 2011, this was taken uh, as a tax referendum, and it passed uh, as a sales tax uh, piece of this, which was part of the financing of the research part, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the organization of the authority occurred in late 2011, and since December, we have been meeting publicly uh, and uh, trying to sort of uh, understand what we have created, how we're going to work as a community together to to see this sort of whole project move forward. Um, I think, sort of, from my perspective as someone who's just been on this, I'm just sort of reflecting a little bit on this as someone who's been on the board. I think, to a certain extent, there was a process that we were moving forward with that involved uh, communication with uh, with the city leaders. Um, we interviewed each and every one of the city board of directors as we sort of moved through this process, all of whom expressed their concerns and expressed uh, their support in some cases for what we were trying to do. Uh, they understood what value it would bring. I think they sort of rightly so were just concerned about how we would manage to pull all this off. But it was to a certain to we were involved with the community, but at a level I think it's much different then than the level that we're finding ourselves involved with today. And that's what we maybe should talk about when we get to the kind of question of the history of this. I want to get through the history, kind of just sort of give you some feeling for, for what I think I see, and then I'd love to just discuss this, because I, I think we are in the, what I believe is probably the most important phase of this thing now, and that's the community engagement aspect of it, which uh, the universities uh, will lead in this process as we move forward. So if you go to page three, um, and again, I would uh, sort of mention a lot of this is a website that I've got listed there. So that annual uh, technology group report appeared in May of 2009. I think there were some recommendations in that with regard to sites and criteria being used for those site selections that have been the discuss uh, topic of great discussion and discussed that uh, at length here as well. Um, we initiated the, the board of directors um, and um, our bylaws were completed. And again, this was a this is actually something I pulled out of one of my reports to my advisory board. Um, it's a coordinated effort between the Little Rock Regional Chamber of the City of Little Rock, uh, EDA, actually. I haven't sort of talked a lot about EDA. Maybe I'll mention that here. And then the, the, the research institutions that are involved. The financing of this park, an important issue, aside from the very, very important community issues that we're talking about here, uh, is one that will, uh, when it sort of does play itself out, will be financed uh, probably a little less than half by the, the tax referendum that was passed in September. Uh, the other part of that is going to come from private sources, and some of that will come from the EDA, uh, Economic Development uh, Administration. Um, my little incubator over the corner of Cedar and Horse Street, we expanded that to from seven to 14 companies with EDA funding that I was able to attract here because of uh, 
the stimulus of money that was available from the Obama administration. And there was an act uh, signed by uh, President Obama called um, Federal Parks Legislation in January of this year, which in fact was worked on with great uh, care and uh, vigor by our um, by our legislators here in Arkansas that sort of tailor makes uh, the criteria in that federal parks legislation fit nicely into the research park that we're talking about here. So there is the anticipation if we can basically provide the appropriate justifications in all the things you do in driving federal dollars into an effort like this that we should be able to garner significant funds from the EDA in support of this park. So in an ideal world, we would like to have the, the tax dollars, the private uh, uh, donations that would come into this, and the federal dollars pay for what, what I'm going to describe as phase one of this project. So we're talking about phase one of a project that will have many phases to it as the park develops. But the concept is we want to get phase one developed, and I'll describe that in a few minutes, and be in a debt-free situation so that we can see the benefit of that and develop for driving additional expansion of the park. Uh, so that that federal uh, research park legislation is a is a important one that we remain close to, and as we continue to move our program forward, quite frankly, a lot of the same rationale and criteria that we use for driving a research park in our region are the very ones that I use for building additional space in my incubator at, um, at the corner of Cedar and, and Fort Street. Um, this is, uh, I'm sorry, we just, I didn't get the slides made, but there's, there's a there's the children's hospital. I mean, actually have one of the other slides set. Let's see if we can just pull that up for, for um, now. Um, I think everyone is familiar with where the different universities sit in the little uh, poorly uh, reproduced uh, slide that you see at the bottom of page three. The concept here is location, location, location. That's going to be a very big issue for us as we move this thing forward. Um, and the, the, the thrust of the initial uh, uh, recommendations by the, by the uh, angle group were the location of three sites. And I think if you look on that next page, top of page four, similar sort of picture that's showing a little bit from that, um, that graph that's called uh, presentation that was made at the meeting last week of, of the three sites, those that are on the next to 630, one that's sort of Helen Fair Park, and then down near University near UALR. Um, as, the, uh, as the Craft and Tall group actually made their presentation, their initial presentation of the, <coughs> of the, uh, of the sites, I think things sort of whittled down a little bit for, again, a recommendation, set of recommendations uh, from the Craft and Tall group that are based solely on sort of engineering and other issues. Okay, this is where we get into uh, the different sort of criteria that are being sort of placed on this by them. Um, there's, you know, there's important sort of criteria for um, for black fiber that's needed for the high throughput of, of, uh, of data that's going to sort of be utilized in a park like this. Um, that's one of the issues. Um, and uh, I think what I saw in the presentations, I hope many of you again, again saw in the presentations, as you're looking at these uh, sites here that are shown, that certainly that uh, site, I'll call it site three, uh, has been sort of reduced down to um, to the 30 acres. The 30 acres is sort of the predominant theme. There's going to be a turnaround in each of those. And there are basically facilities that are going to essentially uh, house the companies that uh, I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Uh, as we get into the, to the community engagement part of this, I've sort of listed these here, and I've got those these at the end as well. I just want everyone, if you haven't already thought about it, 
we can discuss this as we sort of get to the end. But uh, as I and others sort of attended the community meetings that sort of followed the initial opening of the, um, the Research Park Authority meetings, it's pretty clear that uh, concerns were major ones for the individuals in those neighborhoods, for all of us actually. Concerns about impact on neighborhoods. Uh, use of eminent domain is a very, very big issue. Again, I'm just sort of throwing them out here. I'm sure you're thinking about it. We'll come back to them at the end. Fair market value for the homes that basically would be uh, displaced in this process. Uh, communication and a voice and decision. Uh, this is one that um, I knew from the beginning we were going to have to sort of figure out how to get this engaged. It didn't take us long after we got going here. The community has been, I think, uh, quite remarkable in its organization, and uh, I applaud them for that. And then as this whole process moves forward, it's the, it's the inclusion of these stakeholders. As, as we, all the stakeholders, as we sort of move this thing forward, uh, the universities, of course, are big players in this. Uh, I think the community is a big player in this. There's a lot to be gained for all of us if we can figure out sort of how to sort of move this whole thing forward in a way that that sort of makes us better in the end somehow. And that's that's the challenge. I think I've told people in this room that this is this is a this is a tough family problem that we're in right now. I mean, it's one of those where many of you can sort of uh, I think uh, resonate with the idea that. Sometimes it's those hardest issues that a family has to grapple with or the things that actually in the end kind of bring them together if it can be done in a way that uh, uh, everyone feels we're going to be able to do. As I talk to all the leaders in this institution and talk to the leaders in other institutions that are involved in the support of this thing, I think that's what we're going to get into uh, in a very big way. Um, there's a bit of a, a slide here that just talked about some of the uh, on the top of page five, the, uh, some of the costs that were initially um, put forward in this, and again, this is data that's a little bit dated. I just pulled together some slides for, for discussion today. But uh, I think the total right now as we sit here today, uh, assuming it would be one of the three sites that had been sort of identified would be about $54, $55 million. Uh, and uh, that one sort of broken down for Site, uh, site acquisition, infrastructure development, and, uh, and the building itself. Um, bottom of page five, uh, it is basically that this is going to go, this will, is planned to go forward in, in stages. Uh, the first stage of this would be the first building up. Uh, in spite of what it says up top, here, or uh, what I said on the earlier slide, yeah, it's, it's right here. It's about 100,000 square feet for that first building. So the footprint is essentially 25,000 square feet. Um, it is probably about twice the footprint of BioVentures. If any of you have seen BioVentures, you've got twice the footprint of that building, and then it would be four stories tall. So it's 25,000 square feet per floor times four. That would be the first building of, of the park with the parking that's associated with that. And then the concept, again, as I pointed out earlier, through this combination of federal dollars, tax dollars, and uh, private dollars would be, would be uh, debt free. Actually, all Tellerine was built in this way. Uh, what we would then anticipate is that as the park begins its development, there are companies that want to basically come here. So there are two, two ways of filling the building with, uh, with technology companies. One is we can grow them from within through, let's say, those that may graduate from my incubator. Um, that takes a lot of time. There are those that will, that will sort of locate here because they want to be close to the minds of the university. It's good nanotechnology if it's sort of important medical devices, uh, companies will locate here so that they can be 
close to the research enterprise. And that's uh, that, that close is a relative term and one that we'll talk a lot about. Here. So those those buildings that go up after this first one go up are going to be those that are going to be financed by real estate developers uh, that meet the specs and standards that are required of the research park authority that coordinate with the type of buildings that are that have that is in place. Uh, the aesthetics, the park-like component of this that we're looking to be uh, to see maintained. But those buildings that go up sub subsequent to the first one are going to be those that are going to be financed by the outside. Private dollars will do that. Uh, real estate developers may do that. A company like Merck or a Novartis that we do a lot of business with, they may come in here and just decide they're going to build a building. Uh, and they will do that. So those those remaining nine buildings that you see on this uh, on this little footprint uh, is uh, is what is anticipated. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's uh, something that we might want to talk about a little bit. Certainly, um, there's anticipation that we would see this thing develop. But uh, case in point, the Virginia Biotech Park that I, I talked a little bit about and I used as a as a, as a model for what is has been proposed here, uh, they started in 1997, so they're 13 years into their park. They just built their 10th building. In fact, they built their 10th building and they're tearing down their second building to build a newer building. Um, last two pages here are just uh, a little bit about the American Peace Bill, it's, I think it's a bit of a distraction for us right now, but I want you to know that every effort is going into bringing uh, uh, construction dollars to this project wherever it's going to be located that will match uh, as the, the uh, partner and tax dollars are going into this. And I'll be driving an effort from, uh, from the federal side to bring If, if the funding is there, I think we can justify the infrastructure component to this about $9 million. So, um, so could you if, if you if you look back at the just the bottom of that uh, of the, the page uh, or top of page five, um, the bottom bottom of that slide there, uh, that's got the the old fifty-one million dollar number in it. We put together about three years ago. Uh, that site acquisition and infrastructure development is about a 15 million dollar piece of this. I think there's there's some interesting opportunities on the federal side to, to see if we can go after that. Um, so that's that's sort of history. That's where we are today. Um, it has been a um, sort of slow and very deliberate process. I think we've hit a public phase of this where deliberate is really good, and we've got to do a lot of communication. My grandfather, bless his heart, said communication is cheap, and that's what we've got to do right now. We've got to communicate. So as we left the meeting last, um, last Thursday, no, last Wednesday, uh, the, the last uh, research uh, park authority board meeting uh, on the table <coughs> is uh, at the request of uh, the chancellors uh, is creating some opportunity to open this up to either some sort of subcommittee uh, additional task force but basically to let's kind of slow the process down and figure out a way to make this an inclusive uh, process this is uh, from the UAMS side, and I'm reflecting that as one of the members of the, of the board from UAMS. Um, our mission is to basically serve people and create uh, better health for the world. So what we need to do here is to make sure that we are sort of true to that mission. And I speak to the chancellor in sort of telling you that as this process moves forward, it will go no faster than we can make sure that the university is being properly represented and served in this. Um, 
that is from from the top. Okay. Um, so there are there are sort of that's that's the message that I wanted to deliver deliver to you today. Uh, that's the way it all developed. Um, I don't think thing any of this stuff is going to happen overnight, and I quite frankly feel that whatever comes out of this, be it um, uh, one of the three sites that we're they're currently talking about, or if uh, other sites are found or other opportunities, that in the end we are going to be a stronger, tighter community as a result of it. a community of uh, the citizens of Little Rock and basically the uh, uh, this institution, certainly UAMS, I can speak for. So I am absolutely, I'll do my best to answer any questions I can um, and appreciate the, sort of the, the uh, time that you guys have, have given to us. Thank you for showing up and the numbers you have. I'm overwhelmed. Well, I have a couple of questions to clarify. Uh, the black fiber mentioned? Yeah, dark fiber. Dark fiber. I wondered where that sort of the reach of the area that, that where that runs and what area that encompasses as far as utilizing that. And then um, the five minute rule, I've heard different things. I've heard that it originally that it's to talk about driving time, but I had been told too that it originally was really meant to be walking time. And that's not a concern yeah, of these sites, but that so I just wondered I don't know that that, that discussion is ever. I, I certainly that's the first time I've heard about the walking okay. part of it. Okay. Uh, the only thing I will say, and this just is because I run a little incubator that's right across the street from the research enterprise here. Um, sort of faculty are very focused people. Okay. Now we're just talking about the faculty elements of this. They're very focused people, and quite frankly, if they can't sort of get to it and from it in an hour that they have for lunch. Mm -hmm. to go and check on what they've got going in their little incubator or their little company. Or there is a collaborative meeting that has to happen between a company that's located here and, um, you know, and their, their research and office sort of uh, opportunity or, or responsibilities as an institution, uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, uh, I'll say this because I'm a faculty member, they're very selfish people. Okay, they have an agenda every day they get up and I'm going to sort of, you know, get this written and this done and this train and this whatever. Um, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's just they're very focused. I, I understand uh, that phenotype. Um, there is a lot of discussion. I think there needs to be uh, more uh, discussion around this whole issue of proximity. Um, uh, it is very clear that proximity does play a role in the success of these research parks. Um, I was a department chair at the University of North Carolina in the late 80s when uh, Glaxo was Glaxo, Smith Klein was there, uh, uh, Novartis was there. They were all there as freestanding pharmaceutical companies in the Research Triangle Park. Research Triangle Park, for those of you who don't know it, is basically sits between Durham, Chapel Hill, and Raleigh. And quite frankly, it's in the middle of nowhere. But it has, it has survived for years because the pharmaceutical presence was there. And then after the pharmaceutical uh, industry started consolidating, there were companies that spun out of those pharmaceutical companies to do well uh, in the park for a while. But, the Research Triangle Park is in trouble right now uh, because sort of because they're not close to sort of some of the research enterprise that they need to be close to. This is sort of some of the stuff that started starting to filter out of that. Um, so what is that proximity? How how what do we mean by five minutes? And I think what the Chancellor, uh, what Chancellor Ron has opened up is at least let's let's maybe sort of talk about that, you know, as we sort of move forward in this and as we sort of try to be more inclusive and understand what the impact issues are. I, uh, I have the, um, from that sort of area A that you saw on the map, that's the one right along 630, from the Craft and Tell report, we've got 272 inhabited structures in that, in 
that. So I, don't, I think that's an 88 plot. Um, in area B, that's the one that runs along. The B in this initial report, that's the one that runs along Fair Park. Uh, there are 123 inhabited structures in that. And then the final one down there is Bueller, next to, uh, what is the liquor store down there? Top of the top. Uh, that's, that's the one. Uh, there are 113 inhabited structures there. Um, now, that's from their, this initial sort of proposal that we received from Craft Hill. I don't know how accurate those are. Uh, one of the things that I've, tried, that I've encouraged our community sort of involvement people to do is figure out a way to really understand those numbers, what they represent in terms of owner-occupied, leased, uh, whatever, land-banked. I don't know what they are. And that's, that to me right now is one of those sort of kind of important pieces of this that as we sort of get together at the same table as communities and the uh, authority, that we sort of understand those those numbers much better. You know, you guys remember that in that last meeting there was uh, there's been some some organizations that have been pulled together in terms of uh, uh, residents that are are want to want to sell. And you know, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. But um, okay. Let's ask some questions. Yes, ma'am. Along those lines, um, in some of the other communities that you've looked at, what's the timeline been for get, coming to understandings with the residents and, and actually being able uh, to purchase land and start construction? Yeah, well, I, that's, that's a great question. I don't have, I don't know to really answer that. The only thing that I think we could probably point to, and there are, I think, probably people in this room that are much better prepared to answer that than I, and that was the children's uh, library, that nine-acre site that went in just uh, on the other side of Ray Winter Field. Uh, I don't know how long that process took to develop, but uh, that was one of those that I don't think used eminent domain as part of the process. This was actually done for a One major years. owner we, of most we, of the we've got, some, we've got some people here who are really about the middle of it. What? My understanding is there was one major owner of most of those structures, and he was motivated to sell. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I would like to make one uh, point clear. Okay. Uh, about it's called Area One with the Crafton Tunnel, I believe. But it's Area Three was what it was yeah, called in the meeting the other night. The one nearest the freeway is Forest Hills. That's the area in which I have my home, and we're a majority of owner occupied. And um, we were not one of the three sites mentioned in the Ankle Report. The only reference made to our area was it was part of the 12th Street Corridor and it is residential. The original third site that was mentioned was east from east of Fair Park. East of Fair Park? Yes, sir. Okay. West of you. West of, west of you. Oh, west, west of me, I'm sorry. Yeah. West of Jonesboro, I think it was, a fair part. Not toward, toward University. Yes, sir. Yeah. We were not mentioned at all. We found out almost two and a half years later that ours was one of those that was chosen. So we had the disadvantage of two and a half years to think about this, you know, and, and to decide how we feel and to react to it. So that's why we had to act so quickly. And um, so we've been involved in doing an inventory of our area for historical uh, preservation and so we've come to learn quite a few statistics about our area and working with other people who are doing the same and we have found that we are a majority owner occupied okay okay but somewhere somehow we've got to get all that data on the table as a 